Well, well, well. I fancy that. Gee whiz. Hello, Neil. I'm fine, Zach. Good to see you, John. Well, I wonder why I said you were going to uh, Blue Lips and Tans this morning. There's a lot of handshaking to be done down in our studio. That's where we're going to kick off the programme. So if you're ready and fit, we'll get down there. Right. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Well, what is Tom, you can see that your home side has turned out for you tonight, the Finney family. But first, thanks to the names that go with those famous faces. Ex-England skippers Billy Wright and George Hardwick. Laurie Scott, Johnny Haynes, Will Mannion, Ivor Broadis, and Ronnie Clayton. And here with their wives, your brothers Dennis and Roy, with their husbands, your sisters Madge, Peggy, Doris and Edith, and with their wives, your nephews, Joe, David and Robert. And of course, the lady you selected as your teammate 43 years ago, your wife, Elsie. Now, obviously, we've some of the greatest names from international soccer with us tonight, but there is a keen supporter, isn't there, you know of, from a very different world. One of Tom's greatest fans. And it's he's true. also a famous film star. And if you look at the screen, Tom, we caught up with him at half-time during filming in Paris. It is Omar Sharif. Hello, Tom. Of course, you wouldn't remember me, because in the days that I met you, you were much more famous than... I was because I wasn't in films yet and you were already a very great football player. You were in Egypt stationed during and just after the war and you were part of a terrific football team which was a um, selection of all the armed forces s stationed in Egypt that was called the Wanderers and one day you were playing against a team, uh, an Egyptian team, the national club which was the best club we had in Egypt in those days and I was sitting on the reserve bench shaking in my boots because I was scared they would call me to come in and play because you see I was back and I knew you would have run circles around me and I watched from the bench just hoping no one would get hurt and no one would ask me to come in Tom have a good evening I wish I could have been with you tonight I haven't seen you since but you were a terrific football player and I would think a wonderful person. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Omar Sharif. Well, that was a narrow escape for Omar Sharif. Did you have any idea of that story, Tom? No, I didn't actually until I read it in some magazine that he was keen on football and had watched me play in, uh, when I was stationed at Abbasi Amarix just outside Cairo. Well, Omar Sharif and Paris, it's all a bit rich for our palate, so let's try something a bit more down-to-earth. How about a nice big bowl of shredded wheat? <laughs> or how about 50 nice big bowls of shredded wheat? <laughs> well, let's get to the crunch with your son, Brian, and daughter, Barbara. And with them, Brian's wife, Marlene. <laughs> and the children, Donna and Paul. And Barbara's husband, Jim. Now, Brian and Barbara, what's all this about your dad stuffing down a wheat field? I mean, even real men like me can only manage three. That's right, Michael. Um, but I think that day we went through about 50 boxes of <laughs> shredded wheat and a gallon of milk. <laughs> <laughs> when was this then, Barbara? I think it was in 1955. Brian was about seven and I'd be five. And we went down to London to do the commercial for shredded wheat. 
but we didn't realise it would take so long. Well, we have a picture of you, in fact, from that commercial, taken, <laughs> taken shortly before you exploded, I imagine. Yeah. Still, Tom, a diet like that might account for your remarkable sudden burst of speed. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, Tom Finney. This is your life, and the future England legend was born on April the 5th, 1922, at 21 St Michael's Road in the Preston district of Deepdale, mm -hmm. only a goalkeeper's kick from Preston North End's Deepdale ground. That's you, age seven, pictured with your sisters mm -hmm. and your late brother, Joe. Now, Peggy, where was the setting for that family portrait? It's taken near to Granny's, outside a chip shop. More, more high-energy grub, then. Mm -hmm. But, Tom, I mean, how old were you when you first tasted the thrill of going to Deepdale? Well, I think the first time was about five when my father took me to, uh, to watch uh, Preston play and Alex James then, of course, was uh, a great favourite at Preston and was a great player too and uh, from that day on, I mean, I just fancied myself as another budding Alex James and, of course, signed for Preston as uh, an inside forward. Yeah, well, don't go ahead too fast. The story has yet to be told. <laughs> now, now, your father, Alfred Finney, ran a local junior soccer team and there you are, age 11, with your first... <laughs> Your first medal already showing us why they call it Proud Preston. 1936, and age 14, you're picked for the Preston schoolboys team to play West Ham schoolboys in London. There's the team of half a century ago before boarding the steam train. And that's you, still in short pants, well, shortish anyway. But who is this over your right shoulder? Because of him, the young Tom Finney never got to kick a ball in that prestige match. Mm. Sorry about that, Dom, but they selected me at the inside left instead of you. Well, how could they do it? Silly is your first reserve tonight, Tommy Huff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tommy, obviously, you both competed for the same position, but I know it didn't end there because you both joined the club as part-time pros, and how much a week did you Ten get? Ten a week. Ten pot, Ten fifty p. Still competing for the same position. Yes. One match at Manchester. A lad named Eddie Burke got hurt, and the following Thursday, Tom took his place in Deepdale, and that was it. He was born. The right winger. A great player. Yeah. Thank you, Tommy Huff. Now, Tom, you were offered full-time professional terms with the club, but by then, age 14, you'd become an apprentice plumber. You opt for a bit of security, and you stay part-time pro to complete your apprenticeship. And one winter's day in 1938, you're called out to deal with ice-blocked guttering at a doctor's surgery in Watling Street Road. And, Tom, you didn't half put the wind up the neighbours when you climbed on the surgery roof. Yes, the plumber who taught you all you know about burst pipes and ball cocks, Tommy Johnson. <laughs> Is everyone up there called Tom? Yes. <laughs> now, Tommy, you were there that day 50 years ago. How was it that Tom scared the neighbours? Well, it was winter time and there'd been a lot of snow about. <clears throat> and the boss sent Tom and I to this doctor's surgery in Watling Street Road, which had a, a glass conservatory attached where the patients used to wait. And over the top of that, this roof had a lot of snow on it, and it looked likely to come through the glass roof. And Tom said, I'll do it, and he goes up the ladder, he walked straight onto this slated, snow-covered roof, and started sweeping the snow like he was sweeping the pavement. And one of the neighbours saw him, got on the phone to the boss and said, will you get this lad down before he kills himself? <laughs> And uh, by the time the boss came, Tommy was down, of course, and he moved the snow and he was all safe and sound. But I thought that was an early example of his footwork and balance, which he developed a great extent, you know, later on. Everybody knew about it then. <laughs> well said. Thank you very much. Tommy Johnson. Thank you. <laughs> now, Elsie, it was around that time, wasn't it, that you and Tom met at a church hall dance? Yes, it was. We actually had a, a foursome of us, and we'd made a date, but I actually finished up with the wrong man, which was him. <laughs> That's it. Don't go into too much detail, I think we get the story, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, now, the outbreak of war comes between the young lovers and Tom. You become a serving Tommy. You're posted to the Middle East in the Royal Armoured Corps. And as we heard earlier from that great little fullback, Omar Sharif, mm -hmm. you developed your skills playing alongside other soccer stars in uniform. You see action in Italy as a tank driver with the 9th Queen's Royal Lancers, often under heavy shellfire. 
The Allied forces get bogged down in mud after torrential storms, and you looked set for a winter in a far from Deepdale front line. And Tom, we couldn't believe our luck when the top brass pulled us from the front line to play for the 8th Army soccer team. So together you saw more cheerful action, ex-Glasgow Rangers and Scotland International. Of course, it's Willie Thornton. So, Willie, you were pulled from the front line to play at Rimini, but it was hardly a safe result, was it? Uh, not really, because there's such a vast crowd there and a few poor unfortunate soldiers climbed over the wall and uh, stood on landmines and uh, we had to sweep the ground before we actually started the game. Mm. Then later on I caught, caught up with Tom and England and Scotland internationals when he played at Hamden and uh, tortured the Scottish defence and little did the huge Scottish crowd realise they got free boarding digs from myself and my home, which were thoroughly enjoyed. <laughs> Good job they didn't, though. Thank you very much indeed. And someone who would agree that that is another Army teammate who couldn't miss tonight, your old England pal, the great Joe Mercer. Oh. Well, now, throughout the war, you've courted Elsie by airmail, and in 1945, you returned to Preston to make her your wife, here at Emmanuel Parish Church, Preston, on the 1st of November, 1945. Elsie, where did you go for your honeymoon? We actually had three days in Bispam. <laughs> but we didn't get three days because Tom played in a game of football at Manchester. So I spent one day in Manchester and two days in Bispam. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> but uh, De Mob does finally roll on, and the local lad comes home. Stretching ahead of you, two decades of glory with Preston North End and England. You and your colleagues here got near pop star adulation. The jam-packed terraces roared for more, and you were happy to oblige. 3-1, but England's ten men weren't done yet, and it was Finney who made it 3-2 with a lovely lock. When the wind blew the referee's coil at Deepdale, it was evident that the gale was going to play a big part. In what might otherwise have been a vintage cup tie between two classic teams, Preston North End and Tottenham Hotspur. England outside right Finney required three men to look after him most of the afternoon. Spurs left back, Willis brought Finney down from behind. The referee gave a penalty. Three times, Finney blew the ball from the spot before Finney scored. Almost at once, England in white shirts began to look dangerous. They were on the attack when a foul by Campanal against Finney led to a penalty. To the great annoyance of at least one Spanish spectator. Pray be seated. And so it continued until just before half-time when from an opening by Lawton, Finney scored. Well, 76 caps. Seventy-six caps and a record thirty goals for England, plus one very rare honour. Monty himself signed his programme at Hampden Park to you for the man who fought with me in the Eighth Army. Did that just come out of the blue? Yeah, well, it did really. But uh, we were introduced to uh, Willie was playing in this game actually when we we played England Scotland at Hampden Park, and we were introduced to um, Field Marshal Montgomery prior to the game, and he just said to me like when he was shaking hands with us and they see you beat these buggers today. <laughs> uh, I suppose he said the same thing to Willie as well. But, uh, and then after the game he, he came in and said that he would send me, he gave me his actual programme signed and said he would send me a signed photograph of himself, which he did. And you've still got them. Mm. But as well as the glamour of international matches, there was the day-to-day -day business of getting on with playing for Preston. 472 games, 210 goals, no less. And who better to bring back memories of those halcyon days than that, that impeccably behaved young man who played just behind you at right half. Yes, it's the man who says he's had more clubs than Jack Nicklaus, the Doc, Tommy Doherty himself. Hello, Tom. Good to be back at Deepdale again, of course, where we spent many, many happy years together. Great days, and of course, uh, with us tonight, we have some of the stalwarts from those days, of course. Number one, our goalkeeper, none other than Jimmy Gooch. 
Fullbacks Joe Walton, Billy Scott, and our Scottish defender Joe Dunn, of course. And who else? Baxter. Now, where is. Where's Baxter? I know where he'll be. He'll be in the bath having a fag. <laughs> <laughs> We used to enjoy a smoke after the game in the bathtub, but the bathroom in now is not as big as the one we used to have. Come on, Jimmy. Tom, that was all of the reception I got, and I came on instead of you. Well, it would have cut the gate in half, wouldn't it, Tom? Never mind the booze. Three cheers for Tom, lads. Hip, hip. Hooray! Hooray! Hip, hip. Hooray! Hip, hip. Hooray! <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm afraid that Tommy can't be with us tonight, but your teammates can run out again. They are Harry Anders, Jimmy Baxter, Harry, 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 Jimmy Goose. only one tummy in that lot. <laughs> now, Nat Lofthouse, back in those days, you recall a very odd payday, right? I can remember one payday. We used to go out doing testimonial games with Tommy and I. I used to travel around. And he picked me up at 12 o'clock on a Wednesday lunchtime at Bolton. We travelled to Grimsby before the motorways. We played the game at Grimsby. We travelled back after the game and we got home at Bolton at 3 o'clock at morning. And you know what we got each? Two pound a cod. <laughs> but, it, but it were fresh. And you'd certainly earned your place. No. Sorry. Tom, there is another soccer legend who, alas, can't be with us tonight because uh, he has to be in Johannesburg. But let's just catch a mesmerizing glimpse of your joint soccer skills. Matthews on the right wing was as tricky as ever and kept on making openings. Then came the only score of the match, a goal by Finney. And on the line from Johannesburg, who else but Sir Stanley Matthews? Hello, Tom. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight to share in your joy. Remember when we played for England? We travelled all over the place together and shared the same hotel rooms. Remember all those bananas? <laughs> Cast your mind back to the 1950 World Cup in Rio. The food was so poor, we ate bananas all day long. Okay, Tom, have a great time. I will be thinking about you. So long, old pal. Thank you, Sir Stanley Matthews. <laughs> I've made a change from shredded wheat to all the bananas. <laughs> now, your success story, Tom, doesn't end with the game's final whistle because you went into partnership with your brother, Joe, as plumbing and electrical contractors, a business which flourishes to this day. Now, these days, your late brother's son, Joe, is in the business, and Joe, Tom has retired, hasn't he? Yes, and wherever we travel throughout the country, people ask how he's going on, they all ask about him. And I was impressed not that very long ago, and one of the old chaps said, I believe Tommy has retired finally. I said, yes, he's definitely gone. I see he's only starting work at half past seven now instead of 20 past. <laughs> <laughs> now, in 1954 and 1957, you were voted Footballer of the Year. In 1961, Tom, you were awarded an OBE for services to soccer. And in 1979, made a Freeman of Preston. 1982, and you're chosen to lead out the teams of the England versus Scotland centenary match, hearing again the kind of roar that so often in the past heralded your own Wembley appearance. And there are a couple of fellows who'd love nothing more than to run out of that tunnel with you as teammates for England's next match from Anfield, Liverpool and England's John Barnes. Tom, I was very honoured and flattered when our styles were compared. And if I could achieve in my career half of what you have, I'd be more, more than happy with that. I'd just like to wish you a great night. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Someone else. 
from Old Trafford, Manchester United and England captain Brian Robson. You know, I've always admired you and I've respected you as a, as a person, not just as a player. When I've looked at you on TV programmes and you've done interviews and everything, um, you've always come across great as far as I'm concerned. You've never got a bad word to say about anybody. You always support football and football's always been the first love of you. But like I say, I've always respected and admired what you've done through the game and I hope you have a tremendous night tonight. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Robson and John Barnes. Now, Tom, what you weren't aware of in your playing days at Preston was a schoolboy fan who was to graduate from the terraces of Deepdale to the seat of government. He had a stand seat for tonight, but parliamentary business means he can't be here in person. But from the Department of Energy, where he is Her Majesty's Secretary of State, Honourable Cecil Parkinson. Hello, Tom. I find people are surprised uh, when they hear that I'm a lifelong Preston North End supporter because I lived in the South for a long time now. Uh, but what they never had the chance of doing was what I did, which was of seeing you play football for Preston. And I'll never forget the goal you scored against Manchester City, when you beat about half a dozen people and thrashed the ball from the corner of the penalty area right past Bert Troutman. But it wasn't just your football, Tom, that uh, attracted so many people to become fans of yours. It was the way you behaved, the fact that although you got a lot of stick, you never retaliated. Uh, you retaliated in, in your own way. You played better and better and scored more and more goals. So uh, I wish you a very happy evening. Thank you, Cecil Parkinson. And talking of fan worship, let us meet someone who can safely say the great Tom Finney is a fan of hers, your three years old granddaughter, Lauren. Oh. But Barbara and Jim here have a son too, and who knows, maybe one day he'll come to the rescue of Preston and England, your six years old grandson, Lee. Oh, Lee. Tom Billy, try the Preston. This is your life.